diamonds, iridium, platinum and gold. Many of the compounds he worked on are also used in a huge variety of applications. For example, coordination compounds are used in photography, gold plating and in the extraction of gold and silver. Ammonium nitrite finds use as a rodenticide, a microbiocide and as an agricultural pesticide. Organic sulfur compounds are used in numerous pharmaceutical agents, insecticides, solvents and in preparing rubber and rayon. He published over 100 papers in reputed journals on these subjects and earned a huge international reputation. This discovery of mercurous nitrite, in a sense, was the catalyst for the study of pure chemistry in India. Ray was truly considered the father of Indian chemistry. Commenting on Ray's achievements, Professor W. E. Armstrong wrote, the nearest comparison I can make is to contrast him with Berthelot. Not only a many-sided chemist, but also an agronomist, man of letters and a politician. Ray is truly the founder of the Indian Chemical School. The comparison to Berthelot, the French chemist and scholar, proved to be true in more ways than one. One day Ray happened upon Berthelot's famous book, Greek Alchemy. He was interested in the early Hindu chemists and used this knowledge to write an article on the famous Sanskrit treatise Rasendra Sara Sangraha. He sent this to Berthelot who published it with a flattering introduction. Berthelot also wrote to Ray, asking him to continue his research into the ancient texts. Ray writes that this was a turning point in my career as a student of the history of chemistry. Berthelot also presented him with a set of volumes on the chemistry of the Middle Ages, which dealt with Arabian and Syrian contributions from that time. He realized that most civilizations have a written history of their scientific growth. But India did not have this. He plunged in to fill this void with his characteristic verve and application. After several years of study, the first volume of Ray's celebrated work, The History of Hindu Chemistry, was published in 1902. The second volume came out in 1908. They elaborated various indigenous ways that fairly advanced chemistry and medicine was conducted in India. These were immediately recognized as unique contributions to the annals of science. Berthelot himself wrote a 15-page review in Journal de Savant on the book. Renowned international journals like Nature and Knowledge wrote very highly of the book. In 1912, the Vice-Chancellor of Durham University, while conferring the honorary DSc degree on Prafulla Chandra Ray, noted, his fame chiefly rests on his monumental History of Hindu Chemistry, a work of which both the scientific and linguistic attainments are equally remarkable, and of which we may pronounce that it is definitive. All this international acclaim did not affect Ray's sense of patriotism. He was grounded in the reality of India and felt deeply involved with the freedom struggle, though he could not take active part in it because he was a government servant. He was a close friend of Gopal Krishna Gokhale and Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, it was Ray who spearheaded Gandhi's first trip to Calcutta in 1902. He staunchly supported various movements like the non-cooperation and the Swadeshi movement. He would stir up his students with the call, Science can wait, but Swaraj cannot.
A key event that changed Ray was the partition of Bengal in 1905. The angst that this caused Bengalis like Ray is exemplified in Tagore's famous Amar Shonar Bangla. To Ray, this was the final indication that India under the British was not a feasible option. By 1911, following various protests, Bengal was reunited. But Ray's nationalist stance remained. He endorsed both the Charkha and the Khadi movements. This was in spite of his initial scientific contempt for such an antiquated device. But after some analysis, he realized the symbolism of the act of spinning and was a convert. He would spin on his charkha for at least an hour a day and wore only khadi to an extent that his friends would call him Charakshri or Sir Khadar. Alongside the growing nationalism, his international acclaim was on the rise too. In 1904, Ray travelled to England and Europe again on a government-funded trip. The day Ray set off was exactly 22 years after his first trip. But in those 22 years, he had journeyed from being an impoverished student to one of the foremost chemists in the world. He met up with famous scientists like William Ramsey, who discovered the noble gases, James Dewar, the inventor of the Dewar flask, William Henry Perkin, best known for his discovery of the first aniline drug morvine, Jacobus van Hoff, the first winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and of course his icon, Berthelot. Everywhere that Ray went, he was much feted for his work on nitrites. He visited London yet again in 1912, where he represented the University of Calcutta at the Congress of the Universities of the British Empire. He delivered speeches at the Congress and later before the Chemical Society. When he was in London, he received a letter from Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, the Vice-Chancellor of Calcutta University asking him to join the University College of Science as the first university professor. His answer says it all. He replied, I look upon the proposed College of Science as the realization of the dream of my life. And it will not only be my duty, but a source of gratification to me to join it and place my humble service at its disposal. A little background on the University Science College. One of the side effects of the rising wave of nationalism was the Indianization of education. Many new institutions came up at this time. One such institution was the University College of Science. It flourished under the aegis of Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, who had an uncanny knack for spotting talent. Besides P.C. Ray, he was also instrumental in bringing in D.M. Bose, the famous physicist who was also the nephew of J.C. Bose, and C.V. Raman, then a member of the Audits and Accounts Service who went on to win the Nobel Prize. And so in 1916, Prafulla Chandra Ray left Presidency College and joined the University Science College. Through his tenure here, his involvement and commitment to his students became legendary. He was always open to ideas and debates. Friends and students would gather round and new ideas, different subjects were discussed freely, with everyone free to contribute. The college then became a breeding ground for talented students like J.C. Ghosh and N.R. Dhar. He was overjoyed at their successes. He used to quote the Sanskrit saying, A man may desire victory always, 
but he should welcome defeat at the hands of his own disciples. Ray had a great love for literature. He was particularly devoted to the works of Shakespeare and Tagore. In fact, he wrote 19 serials on Shakespeare, which were published under the title The Shakespearean Puzzle. He was in touch with the famous Shakespeare scholar A.C. Bradley. In 1932, he wrote his autobiography, The Autobiography of a Bengali Chemist. Over the years, as Ray grew in stature, he used his position and reputation to try and cause social change. In his presidential address to the Indian National Social Conference in 1917, he made a passionate appeal for the removal of the caste system from Hindu society. He was opposed to various social issues like untouchability, child marriage, and the giving of dowry. In 1922, there was a huge flood in Bengal and the government did little to help. It was P.C. Ray who stepped in. Alongside him, his old students Subhash Chandra Bose and Meghnad Saha also pitched in. His contribution was covered in an article in the Manchester Guardian. A professor of chemistry, Sir P.C. Ray, stepped forward and called upon his countrymen to make good the government's omission. His call was answered with enthusiasm. The enthusiasm of the response to Sri P. C. Ray's appeal was due partly to the Bengal's natural desire to scare off the foreign government, partly to genuine sympathy for the sufferers, but very largely to Sir P. C. Ray's remarkable personality and position. Ray was a true philanthropist. Once a social worker came looking for funds for an orphanage, Ray looked at his passbook. He had 3,500 rupees in his account. He wrote out a check for 3,000 rupees. He had shares valued at a lakh of rupees in the Bengal Chemical Company. He gave these away as an endowment. The profit from these was used for the benefit of poor widows and to help in the spinning and production of khadi. In 1921, when Prafulla Chandra Ray turned 60, he donated his entire salary for the rest of his tenure to the Department of Chemistry and to the creation of two research fellowships. The value of this was about 2 lakh rupees. In 1936, after a tenure of 20 years, Ray retired from the University College of Science. He was 75 years old. He lived a regulated life. He would go for a walk every day. He spent little on himself. The fact that he dressed so simply sometimes led to embarrassing situations. Once Prafulla Chandra Ray went to a hotel where he was to participate in a government committee. The suspicious doorman came up to him as he stood outside waiting and asked, When is your master coming? It took some explaining to convince the man that he was the master himself. He lived out most of his life in almost ascetic simplicity in this room. He followed a strict diet since he suffered from indigestion for most of his life. Ray had never married. He did all his jobs himself, cooking, cleaning, washing his clothes, polishing his own shoes. Prafulla Chandra Ray died in 1944, three years before India became independent at the age of 83. He died in the room he had lived in for 25 years. His legacy can be summed up in how other great visionaries viewed him. 
Mahatma Gandhi. It is difficult to believe that the man in simple Indian dress, wearing simple manners, could possibly be the great scientist and professor. Poet Rabindranath Tagore praised his exemplary life. He said, in the Upanishads, we learn the one became many. Acharya Prafulla Chandrare has devoted his life to his students. He now lives in the hearts of many. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said, Acharya Re was one of the giants of old and more particularly, he was a shining light in the field of science. His frail figure, his ardent patriotism, his scholarship and his simplicity impressed me greatly in my youth. Re summed up his own life in these words. I have no sense of success on any large scale in things achieved, but have the sense of having worked and having found happiness in doing so. Can there be any better way of living? Ray's legacy lives on today. We remember him as a human, as a scientist, as a visionary.